Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. As part of our new inspiring TED Talks series, spotlighting can't miss TED Talks and their key takeaways, today I explore Simon Sinek's famous 2009 TED Talk, Start With Why, How Great Leaders Inspire Action. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I'm excited to be with all of you today, and I'm coming to you from my back deck with the fountain on the background, a peaceful view of the mountains off in the distance. It's really quite pleasant, quite nice out here, and uh, a beautiful place, a wonderful place to be having a discussion about one of the most popular and famous TED Talks ever. Simon Sinek, back in 2009, spoke at the TEDx event at Puget Sound and shared some really great insights about inspiring action in others through our leadership by asking why. It's a rather simple premise. It's not rocket science. It's not earth shattering. Yet he does such a good job of describing the necessity, the the, the fundamental requirement that for greatness and success, we need to start with our own why. And that's really what separates great leaders from others who may be effective managers, uh, effective administrators, but it's truly the great leaders who tap into their purpose, tap into their meaning, communicate that consistently and effectively to their people and drive great results. So as part of our inspiring TED Talks series. Today I'll be sharing his 2009 TED Talk, as well as some of my own commentary and thoughts interspersed amidst his TED Talk. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you on the flip side of this first clip. We assume even we know why we do what we do. But then how do you explain when things don't go as we assume? Or better, how do you explain when others are able to achieve things that seem to defy all of the assumptions? For example, why is Apple so innovative? Year after year after year after year, they're more innovative than all their competition. And yet, they're just a computer company. They're just like everyone else. They have the same access to the same talent, the same agencies, the same consultants, the same media then why is it that they seem to have something different? Why is it that Martin Luther King led the civil rights movement? He wasn't the only man who suffered in a pre-civil rights America, and he certainly wasn't the only great orator of the day. Why him? And why is it that the Wright brothers were able to figure out controlled, powered man flight when there were certainly other teams who were better qualified, better funded, and they didn't achieve powered man flight, and the Wright brothers beat them to it. There's something else at play here. About three and a half years ago, I made a discovery. And this discovery profoundly changed my view on how I thought the world worked, and it even profoundly changed the way in which I operate in it. As it turns out, there's a pattern. As it turns out, all the great and inspiring leaders and organizations in the world, whether it's Apple or Martin Luther King or the Wright brothers, they all think, act, and communicate the exact same way, and it's the complete opposite to everyone else. All I did was codify it, and it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. 
So he's about to explain what exactly the golden circle is. But I thought I would just chime in here really quickly to reiterate a few of his main points. First, there are many super intelligent, capable people who run organizations, who are involved in social movements, who are thought leaders and drive dialogue and conversation around important issues. But what separates one leader and their potential from another leader and their potential? And that's what he's about to get into and explore with you. And it comes back to why. It comes back to knowing our purpose, understanding what we're doing, why we're doing it, and not getting stuck in just all of the tactical elements of running a business or being involved in a social movement or trying to push a public dialogue around an important issue. Of course, the tactical elements are important. They're necessary. You can't get to any action without it, but in and of itself alone, it won't lead to greatness. It won't inspire action. And ultimately, it won't result in sustained effort over time, which is what is required in order for organizations to have exceptional results. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP, but very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose, what's your cause, what's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations, regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done. That's how most sales is done. And that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do. We say how we're different or how we're better. And we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We, have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage. It has you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. People don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. In fact, they tried. A few years ago, Gateway came out with flat screen TVs. They're eminently qualified to make flat screen TVs. They've been making flat screen monitors for years. Nobody bought one. Dell came out with MP3 players and PDAs. And they make great quality products, and they can make perfectly well-designed products, and nobody bought one. In fact, talking about it now, we can't even imagine buying an MP3 player from Dell. Why would you buy an MP3 player from a computer company? But we do it every day. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. It all starts with the why. Why, then the how, and then the what. 
that's flipped from how most people do it. Most people start with the what, then they move to the how. Some get to the why, but oftentimes they never get past the how. And Simon just gave you several examples of what that can look like and how that looks differently within the tech industry, within uh, Apple and some of their competitors. What Apple does differently, what it has done differently consistently over time, is it speaks to the why. It inspires. It looks to create brand loyalty and customer loyalty through a shared vision and purpose, not just the particular product that they're putting out. How can all of we think more about our own why? Regardless of industry, regardless of type of organization, level of our position within the organization, how can we think more about our own why and not get stuck in the how or the what? The goal is not to do business with, anybody, with everybody who needs what you have. The goal is to do business with people who believe what you believe. Here's the best part. None of what I'm telling you is my opinion. It's all grounded in the tenets of biology, not psychology, biology. If you look at a cross-section of the human brain looking from the top down, what you see is the human brain is actually broken into three major components that correlate perfectly with the golden circle. Our newest brain, our homo sapien brain, our neocortex, corresponds with the what level. The neocortex is responsible for all of our rational and analytical thought and language. The middle two sections make up our limbic brain, and our limbic brains are responsible for all of our feelings, like trust and loyalty. It's also responsible for all human behavior, all decision making, and it has no capacity for language. In other words, when we communicate from the outside in, yes, people can understand vast amounts of complicated information like features and benefits and facts and figures, it just doesn't drive behavior. When we communicate from the inside out, we're talking directly to the part of the brain that controls behavior, and then we allow people to rationalize it with the tangible things we say and do. This is where gut decisions come from. You know, sometimes you can give somebody all the facts and your figures, and they say, I know what all the facts and details say, but it just doesn't feel right. Why would we use that verb? It doesn't feel right. Because the part of the brain that controls decision making doesn't control language. And the best we can muster up is, I don't know, it just doesn't feel right. Or sometimes you say you're leading with your heart or you're leading with your soul. Well, I hate to break it to you, those aren't other body parts controlling your behavior. It's all happening here in your limbic brain, the part of the brain that controls decision making and not language. But if you don't know why you do what you do and people respond to why you do what you do, then how will anybody, how will you ever get people to, 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 to vote for you or buy something from you or more importantly, be loyal and want to be a part of what it is what you, that you do. Again, the goal is not just to sell people who need what you have. The goal is to sell to people who believe what you believe. The goal is not just to hire people who need a job. It's to hire people who believe what you believe. I always say that you know, there's, uh, if you, if you, if you um, hire people just because they can do a job, they'll work for your money. But if you hire people who believe what you believe, they work for you with blood and sweat and tears. This part of his talk is so interesting to me as it talks to the human biology, the brain functioning. Now, admittedly, this is not my area of expertise. Uh, I know very little about neurobiology, uh, about brain functions. Uh, but as he describes the way our brains work, it completely rings true with what I know of the social science literature, the research that's been done around these topics and issues. And it's very consistent with what I see each and every day within organizations when I work with people. When you approach something from the opposite way of the circle, instead of starting with the why, and you, you take a more analytical approach, you're focusing on the details, you can convey information, you can help people even understand why it's important uh, in terms of the data, but that's not enough to drive behavior. That's not enough to convince people to actually act and to move in the direction that you want. You have to find ways to get a hook, an emotional hook that comes through the narrative that you tell, the examples, the stories that you tell. It's about inspiring action through the why. That's really what it comes down to. And he explains it very simply through just the, the basic functions of the pieces of our brain and the way we've evolved 
And ultimately, that feeds into how we make decisions each and every day. Now, we're not consciously sitting around um, thinking through all of this when we're in a meeting and someone pitches an idea or when we're watching TV and we see a commercial, but this is all happening in the background and it absolutely influences the decisions we make, the actions we do, and ultimately how we interact with others. So we need to think about inspiring. We need to think about the stories we tell, uh, how we connect to the emotional elements of the brain and what people can resonate with. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, The Journey of Becoming a Truly Remarkable Leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue. What some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There's no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of our problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. And nowhere nowhere else is there a better example of this than with the Wright brothers. Most people don't know about Samuel Pierpont Langley. And back in the early 20th century, the pursuit of powered man flight was like the dot-com of the day. Everybody was trying it. And Samuel Pierpont Langley had what we assume to be the recipe for success. I mean, even now, you ask people, why did your product or why did your company fail? And people always give you the same permutation of the same three things. Undercapitalized, the wrong people, bad market conditions. It's always the same three things. So let's explore that. Samuel Pierpont Langley was given $50,000 by the War Department to figure out this flying machine. Money was no problem. He held a seat at Harvard and worked at the Smithsonian and was extremely well connected. He knew all the big minds of the day. He hired the best minds money could find, and the market conditions were fantastic. The New York Times followed him around everywhere, and everyone was rooting for Langley. And how come we've never heard of Samuel Pierpont Langley? A few hundred miles away in Dayton, Ohio, Orville and Wilbur Wright. They had none of what we consider to be the recipe for success. They had no money. They paid for their dream with the proceeds from their bicycle shop. Not a single person on the Wright brothers' team had a college education, not even Orville or Wilbur. And the New York Times followed them around nowhere. The difference was Orville and Wilbur were driven by a cause, by a purpose, by a belief. They believed that if they could figure out this flying machine, it'll change the course of the world. Samuel Pierpont Langley was different. He wanted to be rich, and he wanted to be famous. He was in pursuit of the result. He was in pursuit of the riches. And lo and behold, look what happened. The people who believed in the Wright brothers' dream worked with them with with blood and sweat and tears. The others just worked for the paycheck. And they tell stories of how every time the Wright brothers went out, they would have to take five sets of parts because that's how many times they would crash before they came in for supper. And eventually, on December 17th, 1903, the Wright brothers took flight. And no one was there to even experience it. We found out about it a few days later. And further proof that Langley was motivated by the wrong thing, the day the Wright brothers took flight, he quit. He could have said, that's an amazing discovery, guys. Now I will improve upon your technology. But he didn't. He wasn't first. He didn't get rich. He didn't get famous. So he quit. People don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. And if you talk about what you believe, you will attract those who believe what you believe. Well, why is it important to attract those who believe what you believe? 
I love that a big part of his focus in this TED Talk is about attracting and retaining the right people because it's people. It's people-centric organizations, and it's at the people in the organizations that drive innovation, that drive the creativity, that ultimately interface with the customers, that uh, create the products and services that ultimately are going to help the organization to be successful. And so we talk a lot about attracting talent and retaining talent, and there's all of these strategies on how to do that. What I've found consistently in my own research is that One of the surefire ways, the best ways to make sure you're attracting and retaining the best talent is not through extrinsic factors like prestige, power, pay, uh, and others, but it's through meaning and purpose. It's through people feeling like they're a part of something bigger than themselves that's ultimately going to have an impact on the world. That's what we see in the example of the Wright brothers. That's what we see in Simon Sinek's exploration of the importance of the why and getting the right people into the organization and keeping them. You want people with passion. You don't want people who are just there to get their paycheck. When that happens, you are you have uninspired people. You have uninspired teams. You won't have the same types of innovation, uh, whether it's products and services, processes, efficiencies, whatever. We need to speak to the why and hire and promote according to the why. Something called the law of diffusion of innovation. And if you don't know the law, you definitely know the terminology. The first 2.5% of our population are our innovators. The next 13.5% of our population are our early adopters. The next 34% are your early majority, your late majority, and your laggards. The only reason these people buy touchtone phones is because you can't buy rotary phones anymore. <laughs> we all sit at various places at various times on the scale, but what the law of diffusion of innovation tells us is that if you want mass market success or mass market acceptance of an idea, you cannot have it until you achieve this tipping point between 15 and 18% market penetration, and then the system tips. And I love asking businesses, what's your conversion on new business? And they love to tell you, oh, it's about 10%, proudly. Well, you can trip over 10% of the customers. We all have about 10% who just get it. That's how we describe them, right? That's like that gut feeling, oh, they just get it. The problem is how do you find the ones that just get it before you're doing business with them versus the ones who don't get it? So it's this here, this little gap that you have to close, as Jeffrey Moore calls it, crossing the chasm. Because you see, the early majority will not try something until someone else has tried it first. And these guys, the innovators and the early adopters, they're comfortable making those gut decisions. They're more comfortable making those intuitive decisions that are driven by what they believe about the world and not just what product is available. These are the people who stood online for six hours to buy an iPhone when they first came out, when you could have just walked into the store the next week and bought one off the shelf. These are the people who spent $40,000 on flat screen TVs when they first came out, even though the technology was substandard. And by the way, they didn't do it because the technology was so great. They did it for themselves. It's because they wanted to be first. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And what you do simply proves what you believe. In fact, people will do the things that prove what they believe. The reason that person bought the iPhone on the first, in the first six hours or stood in, six, in line for six hours was because of what they believed about the world and how they wanted everybody to see them. They were first. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So let me give you a famous example, a famous failure and a famous success of the law of diffusion of innovation. First, the famous failure. It's a commercial example. As we said before a second ago, the recipe for success is money and the right people and the right marketing conditions, right? You should have success then. Look at TiVo. From the time TiVo came out, about eight or nine years ago, to this current day, they are the single highest quality product on the market. Hands down, there is no dispute. They were extremely well funded. Market conditions were fantastic. I mean, we use TiVo as a verb. I TiVo stuff on my piece of junk Time Warner DVR all the time. But TiVo is a commercial failure. They've never made money. And when they went IPO, their stock was at about $30 or $40 and then plummeted, and it's never traded above 10. In fact, I don't think it's even traded above 6, except for a couple of little spikes. 
Because you see, when TiVo launched their product, they told us all what they had. They said, we have a product that pauses live TV, skips commercials, rewinds live TV, and memorizes your viewing habits without you even asking. And the cynical majority said, we don't believe you. We don't need it. We don't like it. You're scaring us. What if they had said, if you're the kind of person who likes to have total control over every aspect of your life, boy, do we have a product for you. It pauses live TV, skips commercials, memorizes your viewing habits, et cetera, et cetera. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it, and what you do simply serves as the proof of what you believe. The law of diffusion and this TiVo example are super interesting to me, and they really illustrate to me why it's so important to speak to the why and the passions and the interests of those who are in innovative spaces, uh, leaders who, who push the envelope, who, who lead successful organizations, leaders who drive social movements, leaders uh, who ultimately help people realize that there's something else out there that's completely different than what they previously understood. They, they realize for the first time that, that there's this new product or service that can change their life and it's something they didn't even know they wanted or needed before. Uh, those are the innovators, those are the inspired leaders. And the TiVo example just shows us how when you're trying to disrupt a space, that makes people uncomfortable. And there are so many people that will not be early adopters. The vast majority of people will not adopt until they see proof of concept, until they see others come first. So if we're out there just to sell products, we're not necessarily going, going to be innovators. TiVo is a cautionary tale. Now let me give you a successful example of the law of diffusion of innovation. In the summer of 1963, 250,000 people showed up on the mall in Washington to hear Dr. King speak. They sent out no invitations and there was no website to check the date. How do you do that? Well, Dr. King wasn't the only man in America who was, the, who was a great orator. He wasn't the only man in America who suffered in a pre-civil rights America. In fact, some of his ideas were bad, but he had a gift. He didn't go around telling people what needed to change in America. He, you know, he went around and told people what he believed. I believe, I believe, I believe, he told people. And people who believed what he believed took his cause and they made it their own, and they told people. And some of those people uh, created structures to get the word out to even more people. And lo and behold, 250,000 people showed up on the right day, on the right time, to hear him speak. How many of them showed up for him? Zero. They showed up for themselves. It's what they believed about America that got them to travel on a bus for eight hours to stand in the sun in Washington for, in the middle of August. It's what they believed. And it wasn't about black versus white. 25% of the audience was white. Dr. King believed that there are two types of laws in this world, those that are made by a higher authority, authority and those that are made by man. And not until all the laws that are made by man are consistent with the laws that are made by the higher authority will we live in a just world. It just so happens that the Civil Rights Movement was the perfect thing to help him bring his cause to life. We followed not him, not for him, but for ourselves. And by the way, he gave the I have a dream speech, not the I have a plan speech. <laughs> Listen to politicians now with their comprehensive 12 point plans, they're not inspiring anybody. Because there are leaders and there are those who lead. Leaders hold a position of power or authority but those who lead inspire us. Whether they're individuals or organizations, we follow those who lead, not because we have to, but because we want to. We follow those who lead, not for them, but for ourselves. And it's those who start with why that have the ability to inspire those around them or find others who inspire them. Thank you very much. 
I like how he distinguishes here between those who lead in terms of formal position. They have a title. They have a hierarchical position within an organization. They are leaders versus those who actually lead. Now, many who actually lead, who actually inspire towards action, often will have positions as well. But that's not a necessary condition. You can lead even without a formal position. So that distinction is an important one. It's not automatic that we are going to inspire people towards action just because we're in a position of authority over them. And leaders, those who really lead and inspire, those who create a vision, those who who create the context in which people can feel motivated by the meaning and purpose in their work each and every day, those types of leaders are ultimately the ones that will drive huge success within an organization not because people do what they say, but because they foster commitment rather than compliance. When I think of a hierarchical leader, those who have a a position of authority, when they get people to do stuff, a lot of times, if they're not an inspiring type of a leader, they're getting people to do stuff because of fear. They're getting people to do stuff because they don't feel like they have a voice or a choice. Getting compliance with what an authority figure tells you to do, that's that's fine. I mean, that can that can move some amount of action, but it never, ever will result in sustainable change or disruption. But those who truly inspire, those who create the context for people to feel motivated by their meaning and purpose, those leaders will drive commitment. They will drive engagement. They will, they will foster passion and leverage that passion to help people fulfill their full human capacity, their human capital potential. That's what we need to be striving for as leaders. I love this TED Talk. I think it's one of the greatest examples of relatively simple ideas, but when consistently applied, can help us to become more effective in what we're doing with our people. It requires a disruption of our thinking. It it requires us to challenge our preconceived notions of what we think good management, successful leadership is. But ultimately, we can do it. Thanks for joining me today on this episode of Inspiring TED Talks, where we looked at Simon Sinek's famous in one of the most popular uh, TED Talks ever, looking at the why. As always, I hope everyone stays healthy and safe, that everyone can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day, and I hope you all have a great week. The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership, Ordinary Everyday Actions That Produce Extraordinary Results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. 
we publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.